Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah, great. So um, you heard brief mention of this in, in Matt's talk. Um, this is gonna be maybe something completely different for most of you. Um, I'm a basic science researcher and we use the zebrafish as a model system, which again, you heard mentioned very briefly. Um, so today I'm gonna walk through, you know, why we like to use this model. I think uh, this is being increasingly used in a variety of different fields to, st to study disease and basic developmental mechanisms. Um, and maybe not everybody's heard of it um, or, or why, wh why we use this as a model. So our general goals in my lab, um, or I guess this is a specific goal as it relates to our Sturge Weber work, is to generate an animal model, in our case, the zebrafish model uh, for Sturge Weber, and then use this model to understand the early disease progression, which is very difficult to do um, in other model systems for reasons you'll see in a moment. And then to use this model also to identify therapeutic compounds that would treat basically the primary vascular defects in Sturge Wember that are essentially embryonic onset. So today's talk, what I'm going to tell you about is, is why we like to use the zebrafish for studying blood vessels and also lymphatic vessels in the embryo. Uh, how we use the zebrafish uh, in, in some of our published work so far and, and ongoing work. Uh, how we use this model to study rare genetic disease um, broadly and, in, and focused on capillary malformations and lymphatic anomalies. Um, and of course, Sturge-Weber syndrome is, is um, a, a class of capillary malformation, or thought to be a class of capillary malformation. And then um, what we want to do to try to identify therapeutic drugs, candidate drugs uh, for treatment of capillary malformations, including Sturge-Weber syndrome. And uh, so to start, the zebrafish, some of you who may have kept fish in an aquarium, these are among the least expensive fish you can buy in the aquarium. Uh, they're very hardy. And so one of the reasons we like to, to, to use this as a model is because we can keep lots of them uh, in our fish facility. They're really easy to take care of. Um, and it, it's, it's uh, you know, easier than mouse. You just need water and food. Another benefit that, that we really like is that zebrafish have incredibly rapid early development. So this is a, a, a movie showing the first, third, uh, first 18 hours of development. So right now it just looks like a mound of cells, but soon what you'll start to see is a head form up here, a tail down here, and then the body here. And it, what looks like a recognizable sort of animal, general animal body plan at the end of this movie. And this also highlights another significant benefit of the zebrafish over the mouse, and that is zebrafish embryos develop outside of the mother. So they're, the eggs are laid and fertilized outside of the mother in the water, and so the embryos are right there in the dish, and we can easily look at them. Um, and, I hate and, to interrupt, Nathan, sure. but um, you have a color picker app covering your presentation a little bit, oh. and it's just it's covering your videos that you're showing. Where is that? I'm not quite sure that it's going to show oh, up on I your see. screen, I'm but sorry. it's showing up for us. It's okay. Is that gone? Is that gone now? It's gone now. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So the other benefit of the zebras. So everybody can see them. What's on there now? It's a movie. You see. It looks great. Embryos. Okay. So, so there. So zebrafish embryos. They they develop externally. They have rapid development. And so they're also transparent. And so we can see right through them. We can see the blood vessels as they form. We can see circulation in the developing embryo. Because they develop so rapidly, this, this circulatory system with a beating heart and circulating blood, uh, blood cells in vessels, that's apparent by as early as 30 hours after the eggs are fertilized. And so between days one and two of development, they have a complete and functional circulatory system. Now we can also, of course, blood vessels themselves are not, they're transparent. So we need to use uh, some fancier imaging uh, approaches. So we can inject, much as they do with humans, they, they, we can perform an angiography. And so that's typically where you inject uh, some kind of substance into the, in, directly into the bloodstream. And in this case, since the zebrafish is transparent, we use a fluorescent substance that shows up as fluorescent green. And then we can image that and you can see very nicely all the blood vessels that are carrying circulation in, in a zebrafish embryo. We can also make what's called a transgenic zebrafish. 
here it will carry a gene that expresses a green fluorescent protein in the cells that line the blood vessels. And so you can see a very similar type of, of uh, a pattern in these two embryos. This is the actual cells that line the blood vessels. And these are the same types of cells that we think are the primary cell type that's affected in Sirs Weber. So we have ways of manipulating those cells and imaging those cells in zebrafish embryos very nicely. And of course, put all these together and what this has allowed us to do over the years is to directly visualize blood vessels and the behavior of the cells that give rise to blood vessels directly image their behavior in the zebrafish embryo as it develops. So we're looking at blood vessels forming in a live embryo uh, here and we can see blood vessels initially sprouting, for example, from the dorsally or to here by using these transgenic lines and the transparency of the fish embryo um, it really allows some really powerful observations to be made. So, and this is where I, I think the most maybe translational uh, uh, benefit comes into play. And that is we can, again, take, a care, take advantage of the fact that there's external development, they have a small size, they're transparent, and we can put them and array them in these 96 well plates and then screen libraries of different drug candidates against them to look for particular effects. And this has been done by a number of different labs um, for a number of different effects. Um, zebrafish embryos have all the normal organ systems of, of a human except for obviously lungs. Um, so they have blood vessels, they have a digestive system, they have a nervous system. And so we can test drugs for different effects on all those systems. Um, in search for potential therapeutic compounds. And I'll show you a little bit about how we've done that specifically for compounds that aff affect blood vessels and lymphatic vessels. So uh, this would all, uh, obviously not be much of a good system if the, the genes weren't the same, but fortunately there's what we call a high degree of conservation between fish and humans and mouse. What does that mean? It means that more than 75% of human genes have similar versions in fish. And the list I, I, I show here is of particular importance. These are human genes that are mutated in a variety of different rare genetic diseases. Um, most of these have to do with the circulatory system or the lymphatic system. And in each of these cases, my lab has actually made mutations in the corresponding zebrafish gene. Um, and indeed, in most of those cases, the zebrafish that we make that have a, have a mutated form of the, the gene that's mutated in the humans have a similar phenotype in the zebrafish. So this is really the most sort of powerful demonstration uh, of, of what we can do with the zebrafish model. And I'll, uh, the one example I'll show, or no, actually I'll show a second example to go into a little more detail. This is one example where you, uh, humans who have mutations in this gene called GATA2 uh, have a variety of different um, symptoms, and it's characterized by, uh, by a number of different um, problems with the circulatory system, uh, but also a certain class that have a particular mutation in GATA2 also have lymphedema, and that's shown here, um, with lower trunk lymphedema. So if we make a very similar mutation in the zebrafish GATA2 gene, we can make zebrafish where this is a normal fish, we like to call the wild type, that's essentially has normal GATA2, and this is one where we've put in a mutation, we've engineered it through genome editing. And these guys have edema similar to the human patients, edema around the eye and edema around the gut. It's a little different, obviously zebrafish don't have legs, but gravity is what's causing the edema to come down to the legs here and it's causing it to come down uh, to the gut and the eye there. So again, this is a, I think this is a really important point to make that we, the, the genes are doing the same things in human as they are doing in the zebrafish. And therefore, if we find a gene in, in humans that we think is causative for a particular rare genetic disease, we can go to the fish, mutate that gene and see if it causes the same problem. So again, our goals uh, specifically in this case are to generate an animal model for Sturge Weber. Now, unfortunately, we're, we're still in early days here. I, um, I was um, in, inspired to start working on Sturge Weber by Joyce Bischoff. Um, and now collaborate with her. So we're, we're still getting our feet wet, so to speak. And, and as, as I'm talking right now, we're starting to screen our first uh, fish for um, ones that carry the GNAC mutation that's, that's known to be uh, associated with Sturge Weber. So um, I can't really tell you about how those are gonna look. Um, hopefully 
actually next July, uh, I think we'll be in great position to, to give you updates on that. Um, so instead, what I'm going to tell you is sort of a proof of principle instead. Um, again, we want to make the models and then study, use those models to study what the, 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 what's wrong with the cells, how is that contributing to the malformations we see, um, and then use that model to correct, hopefully, with the candidate drugs. So we have done a little, we are a little bit further on this with another disease, uh, capillary, again, a capillary malformation syndrome, in this case caused by mutation, mutations in a gene called RASA1. I'm not gonna go into what the gene does, I'm just, just gonna sort of mention that these capillary malformations um, in some cases are similar to those uh, in Sturge-Weber patients, but there are also some differences. Um, and they also have other, uh, defects, including defects with the lymphatic system, which is a parallel system of blood of vessels that drain fluid interstitially. And so patients with RASA1 mutations may present with capillary malformations. They may also present uh, at birth with severe lymphatic anomalies, which cause a fluid to accumulate in the tissue that's referred to as lymphedema. And so we've made a, a RASA1 mutant zebrafish, uh, again, that has a similar mutation that's found in some patients. And again, we see similar, uh, in this case, capillary malformations in, on the adult's uh, skin or scales, they're basically scales in fish, uh, but very similar sort of malformations. And we also see lymphedema in, in these RASA1 mutants. fish. So this is a normal RASA1, fish with a normal RASA1 embryo, and then, a sibling embryo with a mutant RASA1. And again, you can see edema around the gut and around the eye, similar to how um, humans with RASA1 mutations also get lymphedema. So what we can do is we have, a, we've over the last 20 years that we've been doing research, we really have a great understanding of the details of how these systems form during the development of the embryo in the zebrafish. And so what we can do is we can now look in our RASA1 mutant model and ask what's wrong with those cells. Um, and so this is, if you could see in here, and the, remember they're transparent, so these are now just a schematic of where the blood vessels are in this trunk. And from the veins in the trunk to come these cells that will contribute to the lymphatic system in the trunk. These are all the red cells that you can see here. In green are the circulatory, is it a circulatory system? Those are the blood vessels carrying blood cells. And very similar to your body and in, in, in mouse, there are vessels along that that are lymphatic that basically return the fluid that leaks out of blood vessels back to the circulatory system. And they, it develops in close proximity to the, to the circulatory system. So these cells start out here and then they sprout all along what you see as the green vessels and the lymphatic vessels are now red. So it turns out, and if you don't have a normal lymphatic system, as I've sort of shown in the previous slides, you get this fluid that then accumulates because it can't drain properly back to the circulatory system. So again, these patients with RASA1 mutations have this problem, but nobody knows why. So we can use those zebrafish to understand why that is. And if we look very closely at early points, we can see that these early lymphatic cells that will give rise to the lymphatic system, there are now way too many of them. And what we've found is that they're now those cells don't connect up to where they should. And so the lymphatic system becomes uh, abnormal, leading to the problems with fluid accumulation. Right, so now we have a cellular defect. We know what's wrong with the cells that gives rise to this, this basically tissue level and organismal level defect. So now what we can do is we can think, well, maybe we can screen for drugs that may stop this. Maybe we can screen for drugs that would block the, basically, you're forming too much lymphatic cell, too many lymphatic cells. So simplistically, we would think, can we find a drug that blocks that effect? And we would also want those drugs to not cause any problems with the blood vessels that are already there and also not cause any problems with the rest of the embryo. And so this is how we can, this is a, a benefit of the fish. We can screen for drugs that don't affect anything else in the embryo except lymphat the lymphatic vessels, as you see here. And so we've done this in just normal embryos. We've screened about 3,000 compounds. We have initially gotten six hits that block lymphatic vessels. This is an example of one of those compounds. These are, again, they're, they're not previously known drugs. Uh, you can see a lymphatic system starting to form here in red. 
And then over here, you don't see that forming. Blood, blood vessels look quite normal and this embryo looks quite normal, suggesting that that drug doesn't really do much except target the lymphatic system. So we've confirmed that five of our six compounds also block growth of human lymphatic cells. Two out of the five also block the growth of human cells that have an activated mutation that's associated with the venous malformation. And we're now testing them on RAS of mutant, or planning to put, test them on RAS of mutant cells. And we've proceeded to do pharmacokinetic studies. That means, remember the half-life discussion, we want to know what the half-life is of the of the compound in a mouse in circulation so that when we go to do drug studies and xenograft studies where we can put a malformation onto a mouse, uh, we wanna know how much drug we need to give to try to block that and whether our drug blocks that. And so this, is, this has been, so this is an example of where we wanna go when, when we ultimately get our Sturge Weber model is to model exactly what is happening with those cells how is that contributing to a malformation? And then can we identify drugs that may correct the, the cell defect uh, and prevent or alleviate or shrink the, malform the vascular malformation? So in summary, um, I, I think for a variety of reasons, the zebrafish is, a, is a really a great model to study rare disease. We can see uh, to great detail, cellular defects that might give us insight on why uh, we see a particular uh, symptom in a disease. And then, of course, the conservation and genetics allows us to make mutations in the same genes that are mutated in human disease and see what their what problems are. And sort of, I just said this. And then we've we've we sort of demonstrated this, right? So I, I, hopefully, this convinces you that the, the fish is is a worthwhile model. Um, in general for studying rare disease, I think, uh, but in particular for studying capillary malformations and also lymphatic anomalies. Um, and with that, I think, oh, and yeah, so I, I sort of gave you a proof of principle with the RAS1 model. And like I said, uh, not far behind, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months, we'll have the initial founder fish for our Sturge Weber um, model, and then we'll start doing the same sorts of studies for that as well. Uh, with that, I, I have to acknowledge the people in the lab who've done the work. Um, actually, it's been me, it's been myself and Elise Goodman, who's a great technician in the lab, who's been pushing along on the on the um, developing the Sturge Weber model. Um, Masahiro has been doing all the RASA one work, uh, and the former some former people in the lab helped to to to, to establish that model. Um, I really have to thank Elisa Boscolo and Jillian Goins at Children's. Um, hospital in Cincinnati. They're helping out do the, the potential in vivo stuff in mouse where we can validate our compounds in mouse models. Um, and then our small molecule screening core group um, has really been invaluable. Uh, and I have to really point out, uh, this, is, this, is, this is exactly how the pilot program for Sturge Weber is supposed to work. So I received a small pilot award to start generating the zebrafish model. Um, and fortunately, I had to give it up because we got funding from the NIH through a collaboration with Joyce Bischoff and Aaron Green, who are both at Boston Children's Hospital, um, and asked me to be part of their, their R01, um, which we now have together. We have, we have monthly meetings. Um, they're doing cell-based and mouse-based models. Uh, we're also doing single cell RNA sequencing on, on patient samples. Um, and then we're, we're, my lab's also developing the, the zebrafish model. And so uh, this is exactly how the program's supposed to work. Um, hopefully leveraging these pilot studies funded by Sturge Weber into um, more significant grants um, because it, yeah, it's definitely not not cheap to do this stuff. Um, it's it's it take, it's going to take a lot. Um, and if anybody has any questions outside of this talk, these are my contact info. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter. It's more sciencey. It's mostly sciencey, so it's 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 uh, maybe not so worthwhile. But um, but the website also we we try to update um, recent pubs, and then of course you can always email me. Um, I should say, so Julia and Marissa will be visiting us, I believe, next week uh, yeah. in Worcester. 
Um, we're happy to have people visit us, um, come out, check out the fish. We're going to have some nice fluorescent embryos for you guys to look at when you come in. Um, so if anybody's in the central Massachusetts area, um, they're welcome to come visit or at least uh, let me know and we can schedule something. So I got that.